Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of the Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to this evening's program, Curatorial Roundtable, Grief and Grievance. This program is presented in conjunction with our upcoming exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America, which opens to the public tomorrow. We are honored to welcome all four members of the exhibition's curatorial advisory team for this conversation. Convenings like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum digital initiatives are generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I will now share brief biographical notes about this evening's speakers. Naomi Beckwith is the Manilow Senior Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, and formerly a curator at Philadelphia's Institute of Contemporary Art and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Beckwith's numerous exhibitions include The Freedom Principle, Experiments in Art and Music, 1965 to Now, and 30 Seconds Off an Inch, both considering the resonance of Black culture across contemporary art internationally. Beckwith has contributed to numerous scholarly and periodical publications, including Art Forum International, UNCA, Freeze, The New York Times, and W Magazine, and served on the jury of the 56th Venice Biennale in 2015. She holds an MA with distinction from Courtauld Institute of Art and was a Critical Studies Fellow at the Whitney Museum. A multiple grantee and now trustee of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, Beckwith is also a recipient of the New Leadership Award for Art Table and was named as one of the 100 most influential African Americans in 2020 by The Root. Glenn Ligon is an artist living and working in New York. Throughout his career, Ligon has pursued an incisive exploration of American history, literature, and society across bodies of work that build critically on the les legacies of modern painting and conceptual art. He received a Bachelor of Arts from Wesleyan University and attended the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. In 2011, the Whitney Museum of Art held a mid-career retrospective of Ligon's work, Glenn Ligon, America, organized by Scott Rothkopf, that traveled nationally. Important recent shows include De Parisien Noir at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, Glenn Ligon, Encounters and Collisions, a curatorial project organized with the Nottingham Contemporary and Tate Liverpool, and Blue Black, an exhibition Ligon curated at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis. His work has been included in major international exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale in 2015 and 1997, the Berlin Biennale, the Istanbul Biennial, Documenta 11, and Guangzhou Biennale. Mark Nash is an independent curator, film historian, and filmmaker with a specialization in contemporary fine art moving image practices, avant-garde, and world cinema. He holds a PhD from Middlesex University and an MA from Cambridge University. Nash has taught, held fellowships and leadership positions at various colleges and universities, Birkbeck College, University of London, the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program in New York University, NTU Singapore's Center for Contemporary Art, Harvard, and the Royal College of Art in London. He currently is a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he founded the Isaac Julian Lab with his partner and longtime collaborator, Isaac Julian. As a curator, Mark Nash has frequently collaborated with Isaac Julian on numerous film and art projects. He also collaborated regularly with the late Oakley and Weezer, including on Documenta 11 and on The Short Century, independence and liberation movements in Africa, both in 2002 and on the ARENA project at the Venice Biennial in 2015. More recently, he curated moving image exhibitions at the Museo Civico Archeologico and The Coming Community, both for Arte Fiera Bologna, which focused on the legacy of 1970s socialist culture in Bologna. And now a few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately 75 minutes. 
If time allows, we will have a brief Q&A at the end. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming pro public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. And now we'll begin with a slideshow introducing you to our upcoming exhibition, Grief and Grievance. The following exhibition narrative, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America, was written by groundbreaking curator Okwi and Weiser in 2018. In late October 2016, as the presidential election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton neared its dramatic end, Trump's campaign issued a daring announcement that he would stage a rally in the post-industrial town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The rally was pitched against the backdrop of the historical Gettysburg Memorial Grounds, where thousands of Union soldiers fell in battle while defeating the Army of the Confederacy, and in so doing, turned the tide of the war and helped to liberate African Americans from slavery. In November 1863, 153 years before candidate Trump's political gambit, President Abraham Lincoln traveled from Washington, D.C. to Gettysburg, to dedicate the site of the cemetery as a national monument and memorial. In his short but acclaimed Gettysburg Address, Lincoln laid out in terse and succinct words the principles surrounding the War of Secession and the question of slavery. From then on, a narrative of white grievance about the Confederacy has remained as part of the mythology of the South's disinheritance. It gave birth to white supremacy and led to the creation of the Ku Klux Klan, which remains a threat in the lives of African Americans today. In the context of the election of 2016 and the seismic political and historical shift that America has embarked on, Lincoln's entire speech in Gettysburg is worth citing again. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on the great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from earth. Despite Trump's crude attempt at statesmanship, the Gettysburg Address represents the clashing values between the grief of the nation for those who had died defending the principle of equality and the white grievance of the Southern Confederate states dedicated to upholding a detestable ideology. Trump's rally was a surreptitious attempt to obscure and blur Lincoln's statement and shape a completely new narrative of American purpose. Though widely covered, his provocative rally was not given the kind of historical analysis it deserved by the media, especially when it became clear that the choice of Gettysburg as a location for the event 
was part of a carefully crafted strategy appealing to white grievance as part of his larger, divisive, and white nationalist ideology. Before Trump's candidacy, the American public was confronted with the rising number of killings of black men and women across the country by police and vigilante groups. In 2013, the activist group Black Lives Matter was founded in direct response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the shooting death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. The group's simple demand was not only about accountability for the spate of killings, but also the systemic racism directed at communities of color. Black Lives Matter identified the condition of Black grief as a matter of national emergency. President Obama issued a statement about Trayvon Martin, and in 2015, he traveled to Charleston, South Carolina, to give the eulogy for nine members of an African-American congregation shot dead in their church by a young white supremacist. The crystallization of Black grief in the face of a politically orchestrated white grievance represents the fulcrum of this exhibition. The exhibition is devoted to examining modes of representation in different mediums, where artists have addressed the concept of mourning, commemoration, and loss as a direct response to the national emergency of Black grief. With the media's normalization of white nationalism, recent years have made clear that there is a new urgency to assess the role that artists, through works of art, have played to illuminate the searing contours of the American body politic. Included in Grief and Grievance are works encompassing video, painting, sculpture, installation, photography, sound, and choreography all made, with a handful of key exceptions, during the last decade. In addition, there are a series of new commissions created in response to the concept of the show. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'm Massimiliano Gioni. I'm the Edlis Nisson Artistic Director of the New Museum. Welcome to all of you at home and on Zoom. Uh, it's an amazing turnout. I'm looking at the counter and people keep joining. Um, it's also a pretty tough act to follow, the, the introduction of Andrew and uh, the words uh, uh, that Okwi Enwezer wrote in 2018 as uh, part of um, the narrative for the development of his exhibition, Grief and Grievance. So uh, first of all, I, I do want to thank uh, all the team at the New Museum, the, the art handlers, the, the whole exhibitions team that has worked tirelessly in the last four and plus weeks uh, in, in conditions that obviously are far from normal to install this exhibition. So a big thank to them and a, a, a huge thank really to the whole new museum uh, and um, of course also I need to thank the supporters, the, the funders uh, uh, who have made this uh, exhibition possible and uh, let me just rem remember particularly the Ford Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation and uh, Agnes Gand and uh, many many others. It really takes more than a village to put together a show like uh, uh, this one. I also particularly want to thank and recognize the memory and all the incredible work uh, that Okwi Enwezor has done. So while uh, Andrew did a great job in uh, reading his words, uh, I think we, we miss his voice, we miss uh, his laughter, and he would have been uh, much more powerful and, and, and beautiful to hear him speak tonight. So really our thought goes out to him and to to his friends, his family, his dear ones, uh, that, that all greatly uh, miss him. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about the genesis of the exhibition and then uh, hand over the floor to, to the collaborators and curatorial advisors that uh, were so kind and generous to take part in this adventure. Now I'm back with uh, uh, Glenn Ligon and Mark Nash. So the exhibition um, grew out of conversations that Okwi and I had in 2018. At that time, Okwi was contributing to two catalogs uh, uh, for the new museum, uh, uh, the survey exhibition of uh, John Comfra and uh, uh, an exhibition of Nari Ward's work. So at that time, we had an opportunity to speak 
frequently or relatively so. And he told me of a series of lectures that he was developing and thinking about uh, to present at Harvard titled Grief and Grievance Art and Mourning in America. It was an incredibly compelling idea. And, and so we invited him and asked him if he were to consider turning those ideas into an exhibition, a, a, um, an invitation that he took on with a great uh, enthusiasm and energy that always distinguished him. And uh, he started working, uh, we, we, the conversation started in the summer of 2018, and then he formally took on the project in the fall of 2018, worked tirelessly on it until the very last few weeks in his life. We spoke last time on March 1st, and sadly, Okwi passed away on March 15, 2019. Um, after his passing, um, we also learned he had been discussing this project with many artists, with many friends, and so with the participation of many uh, of his um, friends and partners and the estate, and with their permission, we decided to complete and present this exhibition that he had nearly uh, completed himself. In January 2019, he invited Glenn Ligon to be an advisor on the show. Uh, the way he described it at the time was an interlocutor. He said that he thought that Glenn was very informed about young artists and Glenn, <laughs> with great modesty, always said that actually, oh, we always knew everything about young artists. But anyway, he was also a way we felt in which uh, Okui was uh, um, making sure the exhibition would have a legacy and a continuation. And Okui also firmly wanted this show to open in the fall of 2020 before the election. Uh, originally, the show was meant to open in the summer of 2020, and he uh, just um, convinced us all, myself and Lisa Phillips, to, to do it in the fall because he wanted to, to open shortly before the election, which unfortunately proved impossible due to COVID. And, um, and finally, the show is opening uh, today. And uh, so I just want to pass on actually the words to Mark and Naomi and Glenn. I think you should all turn on the cameras. We'll start this conversation tonight. I, I think we'll start from Mark, uh, who uh, had uh, the, the fortune of sharing many adventures with, uh, with Okwi, starting, I believe, from the short century, but maybe you can tell us a little more about the multiple times in which you work with him. Thank you so much, Massimiliano, and uh, thanks to the New Museum team and also my co-curators on this project. Um, yes, I, um, I was privileged to work with Okwi on many exhibitions, stretching right back to his 1997 Johannesburg Biennial, in fact, where he invited the project that I and Isaac Julian, my partner, worked on, France Panel. So we have like a 25-year history, I would say, um, of discussions of art, cinema, um, documentary, and so on. Um, you asked me, Massimiliano, when we were preparing for this talk about um, thoughts on, docu on documentary, and I just wanted to pick up on one of the paradoxes that Documentary 11 was seen as being about documentary, but actually um, we never really discussed documentary in that particular way, I think. Okui was always passionate about photography, cinema, as he was about all, all forms of art. Um, and I think he was looked, discovering ways art and photography link, link us back to reality and to the sort of past present tense that you get in uh, documentary and cinema. Um, I just wanted to say a, a note too about, if you like, the personal side of things, which, which is that Isaac and myself spent time with Okri and um, his partner, Luis Neri over the years. And when his illness prevented him from traveling, we would visit them in Munich and discuss this project amongst many others. And as you said, it was intended as a political in intervention in the upcoming presidential election. I don't think Okri ever imagined that one exhibition could change the tide of history but I think he felt it important to corral the voices of black artists in a curatorial statement, which would be both aesthetic and political. And of course, continuing um, the work of Black Lives Matter, which had already started in 2013, I believe. So um, 
There's many other things that I could say, but I just wanted to reiterate your point at the end, Massimiliano, that in a way the exhibition is also about us missing Okwi. And when I look at the images that you presented of the exhibition, I think he would be really pleased that it came like this, came out like this. Of course, he was quite a hard taskmaster. So he might have said, oh, it should have been done differently, or well, I would have expected no less. And why did you, or whatever, all those questions that you get. But um, you know, I think I think we can all be pleased with the, with the result of the exhibition. Yeah. Anyway, that was just to sort of to get to get started, I guess. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, I should have also added that the the advisory team came together, I believe, uh, uh, sometime between March and uh, the summer, no, or. Uh, or um, and and the choice was uh, I think you Mark uh, described it quite accurately. On one hand, our role was somewhat philological. We we were left with two lists of artists by Oqui and and many conversations that he had with us about also the installations and how we view the show. And whenever Oqui had chosen a specific artwork, we track that down whenever he had chosen a specific artist but not an artwork we spoke with the artist and discussed what their contribution could be like and then there were some artists that he was less familiar with um, but he wanted to know more and there was a separate list and and there maybe our work was less philological and a little more interpretative in a sense mm -hmm. but within the guidelines that that um, I think he had traced in those lists of uh, of artists. Also, he had left a, a, a pretty precise list of contributors for the catalog, and he had written many of the grants. And I think all that, you know, as as I think Glenn said in the past, we can say that this is how Oki would have done the show, but at least we tried to to stay as close as possible to what it was his vision. Now, I, I want to pass on the word to Naomi, who. Uh, I think will tell us a little more about her take on the show. I don't know, Naomi, if you want to say something also about your own connection to Oakley, how that developed or um, or not. It's up to you. Well, I'll just briefly say that I'm absolutely honored, of course, to be here today with um, my fellow advisors on the show. It's been really, of course, an honor working with Glenn, Mark, and you, Massimiliano. Um, and I want to congratulate the entire team at the New Museum for pulling together this posthumous dream of Oakley's and especially not just the exhibition, but this program and the book, which is really, really, really incredible. You know, I think Oakley has always been a kind of signpost of, um, let's say, thinking through blackness globally and rationally. For me, um, I won't go into like, deep sort of interpersonal stories, but I cannot, I think, underscore how important his work has been for both myself and many other folks in, in reimagining uh, the importance of Africa and Africa as a sort of contemporary site of cultural production, especially for you know, a child like me of, um, of Pan-Africanism, one that grew up uh, under the auspices of a kind of imagined homeland. It's really important, his, his cultural intervention into that imagination. And along those lines, I think it's really fascinating to see Okwi turn his attention in, in this exhibition toward the US context, context so specifically. And I remember this being somewhat of a debate amongst us as a team, really wondering if this show um, and the checklist itself should be opened to artists out working outside the US context. And we really wanted to keep to that US context, which for many reasons felt like a, a diversion a bit from Oakley's practice. Um, and of course, later on, after we have settled the checklist and, uh, and written our catalog essays, I realized in doing further research on Lorna Simpson, how important it was for Oakley, um, how important Oakley had been, what important work Oakley had been doing in thinking about race relations in the US. And I um, asked the team and thanked the team for uh, presenting this work in the exhibition by Lorna Simpson, a, a recent painting called Nightlight, which is um, a, a beautiful, expansive landscape. And I wanted to talk about this work really briefly only because Oakley talked about Lorna's work way back in 2005, 2006 as being part of a context that he called the racial sublime. 
it's an amazing term, the racial sublime, and it's one that he doesn't necessarily uh, define uh, succinctly, but it is a, a phrase that points toward, of course, the sense of the uh, sublime in the aesthetics, which is usually uh, put toward landscape works and landscape works that give us a sense of awe, also maybe a sense of fear, trepidation, as well as overwhelming beauty. And, and there's something about this oversized sort of Arctic landscape that Lorna presents here that gives us all that. But she also presents us with an image um, or a painting that has a specter of blackness sort of hiding in it. And I was really interested in how maybe Oakley's sense of the racial sublime might still be working as much in Lorna's contemporary work as it was in the work that he was thinking about um, in 2005. But I also just wanted to maybe read just a short passage from uh, Oakley's essay on Lorna because I do think it also allows us to really understand maybe what he'd been thinking about in terms of the American race relations. And it goes as such. In America, race constitutes its own form of madness, along with its own asylums and governmentalities. From the earliest moments that European colonists arrived on the American shores, race has been the great alloy of a potent social experiment, one that produced slavery and the plantation economy. Being as they were places of seizure, the confinement on the plantation under slavery mobilizes similar senses of capture and stigma. Race in America simultaneously represents the unspeakable and the irrepressible, as well as an epistemological model of biological differentiation that produces a prodigious body of discourse and representation. And like madness in the, in the asylum, it enjoys a particular kind of censure behind the high walls of its own asylum. Except, unlike the asylum, which is ringed by thick mortared walls and protected by a forbidding gate, the madness of race exists nakedly visible in the tumescent flesh of the American social ideal. And it is practiced in the open terrain of the cultural landscape. So I leave us with these words and perhaps this image to really imagine some of the ways in which uh, Oakley very strategically thinks about um, the activity, the activation of race in the US as madness, but also thinking about the sublime, those things which extend beyond our reason and understanding. Thank you, Naomi. I, I'm sure we'll go back to, to some of those terms. And now we wanted to hear from Glenn uh, who I think has some notes, and, and then we'll dive into a, a conversation. Uh, thank you. Well, first, I want to thank Massimiliano and the New Museum uh, for hosting the show, for being such a good partner, for, you know, bringing Oakley's vision into the world, uh, and inviting me to be part of the team that was going to bring that into the world. And, and, and after the presentations Naomi and Mark gave, I, I can sort of guess that gives the audience a sense of what a pleasure it was to work with you two. You know, the rigor with which you approached this task of making this exhibition and the thoughtfulness and you know, both of you have curatorial experience and I, I play curator, I'm not a curator, but I feel like I learned an enormous amount from following your leads and debating with you, listening to you. So thank you so much. Um, I was just gonna talk briefly about the essay I wrote for the catalog. Um, and it was funny to me that, um, Naomi, you talked about this term, the racial sublime, because the title of my essay in the catalog is the climate of blackness. And that comes from a term that Oakley used in an essay about uh, Frank Bowling, who uh, was retrospective Oakley curated for the Haus der Kunst in Munich. And he was talking about um, Bowling and abstraction and the notion that abstraction for artists of color happens within this, you know, or particularly black artists happens within this climate of blackness. And I sort of use that phrase to tie into ideas from 
Christina Sharp, um, whose book um, In the Wake talks about this notion of uh, the sort of climate of anti-Blackness that exists in the United States. And so I'm just gonna read a few uh, short quotes that sort of generate my thinking around my essay. Um, this from Christina Sharp in The Wake. Um, the weather is the totality of our environment. The weather is the total climate and that climate is anti-Black. And also um, from Saidiya Hartman, the intimacy with death that was first experienced in the whole of the slave ships continues to determine Black existence. And finally, from Fred Moten uh, talking in an interview about the idea of escape, uh, and he says, escape is an activity, not an achievement. You don't ever get escaped. And so this sort of idea of this climate of anti-Blackness that surrounds the cultural production that Black artists make is something I was trying to address in the show um, and in the work, some of the work in the show, particularly abstract work, because I was very interested in Oakwee's interest in work like um, two of the earliest works in the show, um, Jack Whitten's Birmingham from 1964 and Daniel LaRue Johnson's Freedom Now from 1964 as well. Both, you know, abstract works with figurative elements in them. You know, Jack Whitten with a photo of uh, a uh, black protester being set upon by police dogs in Birmingham and Daniel LaRue Johnson with a Freedom Now button you know, so both of them trying to deal with this vocabulary of abstraction, but also trying to grapple with the now, you know, the, the political climate, the sort of climate of anti-Blackness and how so many works in the show follow from this lead. If you're, talk, you're thinking about, you know, uh, Howardina Pendel or Mel Edwards or Julie Moretu, there's a sort of through line in the show of abstraction. And so that was one of the things I was trying to think about in the essay. Yes, I think, Glenn, you touch upon a, a crucial aspect of the show, which is also somewhat of a paradox. And, uh, you know, having seen it finally finished, you go through a show that Okwe described as uh, an investigation of the modes of representation of mourning, commemoration, and loss, and you slowly realize that it's also largely an exhibition about abstraction. And uh, in your own essay, uh, you quote Oku in turn from, from his uh, catalog about Frank Bowling and with this really startling uh, quote in which he says that abstraction needs not to be disunited from content, especially as intersects cultural experience and historical subject matter. And I think, We'll hear it actually in the next few days from Julie Meretu. Julie and Oak, we were in conversation for an essay that sadly he couldn't finish. And he was very interested in, in her use of the sublime, um, which in a sense was a sublimation of images of violence and protest. And um, so I, I have a question maybe for all of you, uh, both about Oakwe's work and the way in which he straddle if you will, content and form to be quite Manichaean. Uh, you know, I, I always think nobody would have dressed like him if he didn't love aesthetics as much as politics. Um, but also if you have any thought about how this idea of abstraction um, was his way also of thinking of new strategies to deal with the proliferation of images of violence that media have uh, uh, made so common today. I don't know if any of you wants to take on the question first? Um, well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, one of the things that's sort of interesting to me is, uh, and it's a question that comes up, you know, from the press interviews, why is there so much abstraction in this show as if there is somehow abstraction and social justice or things that are very far apart. And I think that, you know, it's from clear to me from Oakley's discussion of, you know, Frank Witten, uh, sorry, Jack Witten and uh, Daniel Rue Johnson, that 
those things aren't far apart for him, that abstraction is social justice. It, it can contain and investigate ideas around social justice. Um, and so it is, I mean, I, it's sort of funny to me that we, we don't have a problem imagining that a Coltrane song <laughs> Can be about you know can be abstract and about social justice, but we we have a hard time imagining that artwork can do that. You know, an abstract painting can do that. So it's just a curious you know sort of uh, boundary that Oakley I think was determined to break. I think that's spot on, Glenn. Especially, um, I mean, what you're talking about is the ways in which Oakley was not interested in these false binaries that we've often inherited in our language and terms uh, through art history and art practice. But I also think Okwe was incredibly um, careful to always move against the spectacle. And I believe a lot of that comes from his history and engaging with photography, especially trying to move past a kind of modernist photography or a modernist photography idiom where, uh, you know, the photograph is always somewhat documentarian. The photograph always gives you the image um, that satisfies your need for knowledge or proof or what have you. And I, you know, Okui has a quintessential postmodernist and whatever may have come after, um, very much believed in pushing against the politics of, of, of the spectacle. And, um, you know, that's not just an aesthetic thing. This also has a deep ethical dimension when you think about uh, what happens to images of, of a Black horror, Black violence, Black grief, and how those things begin to circulate and literally get commoditized um, in all sorts of problematic ways. Um, there is then a reason why I believe Okwi was more interested in those things that can embody some of the affects um, that he's thinking about rather than literally and figuratively representing them. Mark, do you want to add anything? Just a couple of words. There's just um, that term representation made me realize that exactly it's to do with embodiment of affect and the idea that you can, that work can represent emotions is kind of a little bit, it's kind of seductive in a way. Um, but I think Okri was always really focused on kind of the formal qualities of the work and taking that in a way the content was was also generating the form you, you mentioned that dualism earlier on and I I always had the feeling that there was a more of a Manichaean thing that on the one hand you had a set of political issues that he was always really engaged with as Naomi has, has laid out but at the same time there were these aesthetic questions so <clears throat> um, yeah, so photography was an area that he was working in more in the early part of his in early part of his life with the various issues that photography has in relation to politics and social reality. But then more more recently, I mean, I happened to be with him when he, as it were, discovered Frank Bowling, and we visited the, his gallerist, and suddenly he decided this was an artist who really needed to be exposed at this particular time because exactly there was always some trace of figuration within the within his abstract paintings. Um, and so he got on the phone and called the house to Kunst and said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna move the, um, we're gonna have a Frank Rowling exhibition in six months time. So just organize it, please. Um, anyway, sorry, that's a little bit of a diversion, but. <clears throat> Well, Mark, we, we know he was actually also a formidable producer. And, uh, and I think even working on this show, it was just amazing to see how many of the artists had conversation with him and, uh, um, you know, really how invested and energetic he was in, in realizing his, uh, his projects. I, I want to go back to, to something that Glenn was saying about John Coltrane and music, because another aspect of the physical experience of the show that I hope people will have an opportunity to make is the, the presence of sound and curatorially one of the, the most daring inclusion is that of Titian Sori with, uh, 
which transforms music into a kind of sculptural experience uh, in this room for listening to the record pillars. But throughout the show, you hear the sound from the Aster Gates video from Rashid Johnson's installation. And um, so along with abstraction, there is this reflection on both uh, concrete music in a sense and, and sound. Uh, which uh, was hard to imagine actually until uh, the, the show was turned on in a sense. And, and uh, Okwi was more and more interested in that in the last few years. And uh, particularly I think in Venice with the arena, there were so many performances that were hosted there. I don't know, Glenn, if you have any thought about it, both also as, you know, as somebody who has been to many of Okwi's shows, but also from your own interest. I mean, the, the, you know, the opening piece uh, is your a small band uh, on the exterior, which immediately also connects blues with uh, with many of the works in the show. Hmm. Well, I, I think what's interesting is, um, as you said, I think there was a trajectory in Oakley's thinking about sound and the 2015 Venice Biennale with this arena in the middle of the Italian pavilion, uh, which had continuous performances. So. So, so wherever you were in the building, you were aware of or could hear this performance, readings, lectures, et cetera. So that sound permeated the exhibition and, um, and became in, in a way a kind of connective thread. So I think in this exhibition, what's interesting is, you know, partially because of the layout of the building, you know, lots of things bleed into other things sound-wise, sonically. But I think that's a happy, you know, ac not an accident, <laughs> it's on purpose um, because we could have closed off those rooms. Well, maybe not because of COVID, but, but I like that the sound itself becomes the connective tissue in the work, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna butcher his quote, but Arthur J. Foss talks about, you know, trying to make artwork that is rich and nuanced and, ex deep as black music is. And I think, you know, Oakley was thinking about that in terms of like the sonic component of this show being, you know, so important to him and, and, and the bleeding out of the sound from installation to installation. So it sort of like sets a tone throughout the entire exhibition. And literally on each floor, there is competing sonic, you know, experiences. Naomi, do you want to add anything also given, you know, the, the great show you had in Chicago that you created the Freedom Principle, where you, did you discuss any of that with Ogwe at the time also, or? It's a good question. I don't think we discussed that aspect of it. I mean, we discussed obviously um, clearly the importance of black musical traditions uh, and uh, not just, you know, sort of in general, but the fact that at least for the show um, in Chicago, that it was really important to, to um, imagine and honor the way in which so many artists in that exhibition, especially on the historic side working in the 60s, didn't really distinguish between their musical careers and their uh, visual arts careers or even their theater careers, that this kind of uh, intermediary, interdisciplinary bleeding was just part and parcel of a kind of creative life. And, you know, we can, we can talk all day about why that might be, you know, going back to the side of the plantation and so forth. Um, but I'm also interested in the ways in which sound um, can be realized in the show and also slightly, literally sublimated going back to um, your smart twist Massimiliano on the idea of the sublime. You know, the way someone like Charles Gaines, again, a very accomplished musician, in addition to being a, uh, a visual artist is interested in that translation from the visual to the sonic uh, and you see that in his installation in the show too and so that you know music is not just a, a metaphor uh, but music um, becomes even a, a site of conceptual thinking in a way to order how the artworks are presented. And I should add also Okwi had very clear um, in his mind how the show would have been structured on three floors and he, he deliberately wanted performance and sound pieces on each floor. I think he, he was also a way to give a, a counter notation to, to aspects of the show that were very sombering, very either abstract or, or even dark in a sense. You know, I think he wanted a kind of 
poles in on each floor uh, to be achieved uh, through through the performative works. Mark, I don't know if you want to uh, talk a little bit also of the experience of the arena because you you were very involved and close, and also uh, I don't know if you saw the the show in Munich, the um, ECM show about the music label uh, that Oki curated there, which was in a sense a soundscape uh, in itself. Yes, no, the, well, and then Mark, speaking of sound, they tell me to speak a bit louder, to ask you to speak a bit louder. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, well, yes, ECM was an amazing archival um, exploration. It was, Okri, as you know, is very fascinated with the archive and they had a number of exhibitions focusing on questions of the archive, including the Paris Triennial and ECM was an opportunity to explore all the work of this um, German-based music label. Um, it was really the passion, I think, of his colleague, um, Marcus Muller, but Ockrey would got very deeply involved in that. Um, I think with the, the arena, the arena was the crossroads for these, uh, these various concepts that he had for, um, for Venice. There was the question of liveness, and there was also um, the question of epic duration. And so there were, it was Clemens described how the sound permeates, but I think it was more, to my mind, it was more this theatrical uh, working through of ideas. I mean, Ockrey loved to read aloud. He would read us aloud when he was enthusiastic, shall we say, about Derek Walcott, he would be reading aloud from, from Derek's um, Omeros. And the same with Capital. He loved, he, once he had the idea of um, reading it aloud, and he sold myself and Isaac on this, this project in which it would be performed, but uh, performed orally. So there wasn't so much, I'm not even sure how interested Ogri was in theater but he was definitely interested in kind of expanding the, the vocal to, um, well, in the case of the Capital Project, it, it lasted, um, I don't know, it took um, more than a hundred days to read Das Capital um, a couple of times. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it doesn't exactly answer your questions, but um, yeah. Yes, I think it does. I have a, somebody honking their horn in the street. I hope you don't hear it. <laughs> I, I actually, Mark, since you, you are talking, I want to ask you something about your essay uh, in the catalog, which is titled Registers of Mourning, in which you uh, go back to Douglas Crimp's essay, Mourning and Milit Militancy, um, which is written in a very different moment and, and about the AIDS crisis, a different pandemic, um, which may or may not have any symmetry with the one we are experiencing today. But um, I wanna ask you what you found in that essay that, that uh, resonated with Oki's uh, show. And I think one of the assumptions is this idea that mourning can actually mobilitate political action. Yes, that's right. I mean, Douglas, um, had this op opposition, which he takes from Sigmund Freud, of mourning and melancholia. And melancholia is where you stay attached to um, your, the mourning. It becomes somewhat perverse. It, it, it limits you in different kinds of ways. Um, that's the melancholic. Whereas on the side of mourning, you work through that experience. So I think I, I was very struck by thinking about, as you say, thinking about the connection with the AIDS crisis. And of course, we subsequently now have the pandemic of the virus itself, but also the pandemic of racism. And the question is, um, how do, you know, how do we respond to that? We, we, we can hardly grieve um, for every everybody who's killed, it's an impossible it's a possibility that the numbers of death and that's the same actually for the pandemic in many ways. But translating that emotion into creative work, into 
painting and sculpture is obviously one way out. So I think Douglas was kind of pushing the line of, around AIDS activism being joined with cultural production. And in a way, in our exhibition, it's the idea of combining the activism of Black Lives Matter with the um, productivity of the black, black arts sector in, in the United States. I mean, it seems to me that you can, if you follow that line of thinking, you can see the exhibition in some ways it's a very celebratory because you have such so many amazing artists who are at the, in a way at the peak of their game that you no longer need, you know, you, you can think of it as another Harlem Renaissance, if you like, another Renaissance. And that connected in my, in, I connected this in my essay to the historical periodicity to the notion of the first of the reconstruction in the 1860s, then the imposition of Jim Crow laws, and then the attempts to get back to the 1860s. And we're still in a position where pe black people, former slaves have more rights in the 1860s than they do now really. And um, that's, I learned a lot from working on this exhibition with, um, from that from that historical research. Sorry, that's taking us into another conversation, but um, <clears throat> just this idea that you know we're now in another in a period when from the civil rights movement to the present is could be seen as another kind of reconstruction of reestablishing the importance of black art and culture um, in you know in American society. Yeah. And on the other end, Naomi, in your essay, you, you state something that it's uh, uh, as precise as somewhat depressing in, in observing that there is not even a possibility of mourning because the mourning is interminable, you, you say, or something along those lines, which um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. And, and, you know, I think the question is also, you know, the, the realization of that condition without accepting it, that obviously is, um, without accepting it as inevitable, that I think is a challenge. Yeah, that's a way of thinking about it. You know, um, um, I'm also ruminating on this again, as, as you're speaking, Mark, um, about the products of mourning, how mourning can come to a form of activism and cultural production. Um, and, you know, when I wrote those words, I was also really um, speaking through and maybe slightly against the ways in which mourning has been set out uh, in psychoanalytic theory, or at least in Freudian psychoanalytic theory, that it comes in stages and it comes in steps. And as Mark says, right, there is mourning that is a brief thing and then you sort of move through it and move past it or mobilize it and then there's melancholia which is you know in the state of staying in mourning and so the the question I was asking is really well what happens if you're you know um, as we would say now re-triggered constantly where the mourning just keeps the arting over and over again and I think I'm really pushing against this idea of time that um, that there is a kind of arc to all of this. One of the, the questions that I had in my mind early on in this project, especially given the events of this year, um, you know, we were working on the show well before uh, George Floyd, the events of the last year, I should say, we worked on the show well before the death of George Floyd, well before this kind of international uprising against police brutality. And people were asking, you know, how did Oakley know? How could he have seen this coming? And, and I believe that one of the premises of the show is in fact that this isn't about a kind of arc in American life that moves you know, from the plantation to reconstruction, but in fact, this kind of climate of anti-blackness that Glenn spoke about is interminable. I think even in your essay, Glenn, you, you call it the singularity. It's not really about an arc of time. It is, it is the solid condition that doesn't move. Um, I don't know how depressing that is. I think we take it as a kind of real fact <laughs> in many ways, but the question always is, but then what cultural production arises in these conditions that really cannot even have been imagined by Freud and other psychoanalysts? It's super interesting to think about, you know, there being no outside, but also to think about the cultural production that's in that, <laughs> like the things that have been made, you know, 
in some ways imagining an outside, but not living in an outside, you know, and, and the sort of tension between those two positions has produced some extraordinary work, you know, not just, you know, I'm not just talking about work in the show, I'm just talking about black cultural production in general, you know. Yeah, I think that also poses a question and maybe I, this is too personal in a sense. It's the question also of, uh, you know, is the exhibition cathartic and for who? And um, and I don't know, <laughs> I, you know, personally also in myself, you know, I go through the show even asking, um, you know, what am I feeling? And, uh, you know, the question in a sense of exoneration, which also Arthur Jaffa has discussed, you know, when he says, uh, oh, so many white people come to me and say they cried when seeing love is the message. And, you know, that they, they, they crying is cathartic in the sense that, okay, then we can move on. But Naomi, as you say, the, the, it's not that simple. Uh, yeah, it's not just, and yet I guess, we must move on um, somewhere else. I mean, accepting it as inevitable, I don't know also if it is um, a solution, you know. Um, okay, I want to ask a question, jumping from this, um, about some of the works like that. Massimiliano, if you don't mind, the mark was offering a little bit of a, 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 of a statement to you. I would love to hear. Oh, sorry, <laughs> hear I didn't, see you. I didn't yeah. see you, Mark. I was, I was just going to say, following what Naomi was saying, but in a way, if you take the psychoanalytic position that there's no time in the unconscious and following from Blen's, Blen's remarks as well, then we are in a way always repeating this experience and we are still in 1860 in a lot of ways. And I think an exhibition, you can't, you can't go through an exhibition like this and come out and feel that anything is resolved, but you can feel at least positive that some painters and sculptors and some artists are able to mobilize these resources in different ways, but it doesn't, I think it would be a mistake to see that it necessarily shifts anything. And we know from the pol political configuration right now, that there's a kind of well of white fascist hatred there in the population as a whole and millions of people. So, the relationship of art production to that is kind of problematic. So I'm kind of attracted to the idea that we get stuck in this conjuncture and we try to break out of it with certain kinds of art production and ways of understanding it. But um, um, I think, it, you know, I think you're right. We shouldn't be saying, oh, well, I was very moved by that and now I can move on to something else um, because we're still, we're still stuck there, stuck there with, you know, I mean, I come from a country from Great Britain that has a lot of unresolved political and cultural issues that go back to the 19th century too. So it's like taking a really long view on these matters maybe. Um, that's all I was going to say really. And since we're speaking about mourning, I, I want to ask you about some of the projects in the show, like the Ube's Birmingham project or, or Hank Willis Thomas, uh, um, sculpture of flags uh, and Nari Ward's Peacekeeper, which are um, more or less directly confronting also the, the function of memorials and, and monuments. And uh, uh, in a sense, also, Glenn, your own piece, um, you know, the moment is shown uh, outside of Venice uh, uh, becomes more of a, I don't know if I want to call it a, a monument, but certainly in a urban context, he has a whole different presence. And um, so I want to ask you on one end about Oqui, uh, if you had a sense of his research uh, around monuments, uh, thinking of, you know, Thomas Hirschhorn or George Areabo, if he informed his thinking also about contemporary American artists, and, uh, and also if you have any feeling about what, what do memorials mean today uh, in America, if anything? Hmm. Um, difficult to know. I don't know if I had talked to Oki specifically about the idea of monuments. Um, a small band came in some ways, a uh, complicated origin story about where the piece came from its source material. Um, but true that it reads differently 
you know, here in New York at this moment than it did in Venice in 2015 in the context of the Venice Biennale. Um, but I think, you know, any artwork <laughs> changes depending on the context in which, you know, the cultural climate in which it is shown. Um, but it is an interesting question to think about this memorializing impulse uh, because that is, you know, one of the things that Oakley was certainly thinking about in terms of the, you know, creating this exhibition in general, but maybe somebody else has more co cogent thoughts on that. Well, he did have, uh, if I may interrupt, he did have um, the, um, those monuments in, in Venice. Was it the Sarai group, those monuments, those colonial monuments, which were then reconstructed and uh, erected in the Giardini? It was though, I mean, the, the idea was that you could take monuments from British, from the former British India and then place them in the Giardini. And then, they, you know, so there was a kind of, crit the artist critique and Opry was uh, incorporating that into that project. So, um, yes, no, I, I think, but that was, that was like taking, that was a form of quotation and appropriation almost. I don't know if I have a cogent answer to this either, but I am interested in um, the question of whether or not there is a difference between the monument and the memorial. Um, and this, I'm just going to have to sit and ponder for a little bit <laughs> because, you know, I realize that the project basically asks us to maybe um, pull those things apart just a little bit and see if there's a distinction. Well, in your essay, Don Naomi, you, you write uh, beautifully about Daube's Birmingham project as a kind of memorial to, to a speculative history, not that the, the killing of uh, the four girls in uh, Birmingham, then it's played out in all its derivations. No, I don't know if you want to say something about that. Yeah, I mean, thank you for saying so. Um, and maybe that is one of the distinctions. I believe that um, what Dawood's project does so effectively is to mark out a history um, with people who weren't directly involved in that history. Uh, so he takes these um, photos in Birmingham uh, when he's invited there. Uh, he takes two types of photos. One, um, he takes photos of people who were the same age as the children killed during the bombings and the subsequent um, riots that followed. And I use riots very specifically to also mean sort of anti-Black violence at that time, because not just the four little girls died. And he took a set of photos of, of young people who are the same age as those children were when they died and makes these beautiful, really uncanny triptychs or diptychs. Um, and so what you get in that space between those images is a kind of reconstruction of a lost history and a real understanding of all that time that it literally had been wasted away. And so it is true, it is a memorial, um, but not specific. It is more a memorial to the idea of loss and the memorial, the idea of living through these like cycles of time rather than actually a, a monument to those precise people or the sites where these things have happened. And so maybe that's one of these differences too, to live in the space of memory is also to remain in the site of, of affect. Thank you. Uh, is it okay if we open the floor to some questions? from the audience, should we? So let's give them a couple of seconds to, to I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions that arrived. Um, well, there is a question that it's very practical about um, uh, if and anything change in, in presenting the show given the, the current health crisis, um, and I, on one end, I want to answer that we, we have limited capacity, we have time tickets, um, we, we follow all the, the regulations. But I think in a sense, this raises a, a indirectly another question, which is if you think that the reception of this show changed as we then found ourselves in a different state of mourning that also 
we witness uh, uh, disproportionately hitting the black community of America. But I don't know if your thoughts about the show and also about what mourning is today have changed. And, and then obviously we have seen also the demonstrations following uh, the, the assassination of George Floyd. I don't know if you had to rethink some of the premises of the show or if you want to say anything about it. I'll just quickly say that um, I don't know if I would have rethought the premise of the show, but other objects began to stand out and other objects on the checklist began to stand out as um, really foundational for me. And one of those um, are the photographs of Terry Atkins, these kind of x-ray seriographs of these um, memory jars and memory jugs. And I didn't you know, I always thought of them as really sort of fascinating objects, a smart addition to the checklist on Oakley's part. Um, but uh, in thinking through the objects through the double loss of Oakley and Terry, who also we lost sort of prematurely, um, and, and in the way that these are um, an attempt to look inside these small memorials, memorials to the life of a person, um, objects that were made as, um, as grave markers often, and objects that were meant to keep secrets uh, <laughs> in many ways too. Um, I've been wrestling a lot with these works, uh, the ways in which we get a kind of peer inside of, of, of these things, but they don't reveal that much even as the markers and the memorial markers to uh, human beings. Any thought, Glenn and Mark, to add or? Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I rethought the premise of the show, but I think maybe, um, given the storming of the Capitol, given it's hard to deny <laughs> for those people who were in denial before that we live deeply within a white supremacist culture. You know? um, I think that maybe the awareness of those issues, the vo even the vocabulary around those issues uh, has changed over the last year or two. Um, and so the reception of the show, um, I mean, people always say like, oh, it's so timely. And I think people have realized like, as we were talking about before, it's not a time, it's not like, oh, we didn't have some crystal ball. It's just, this has always been going on and certain parts of the population are now just seeing it. So I think that changes the kind of reception that the show will have for, for viewers. Yes, I would, I would agree. I would just say um, it just current circumstances just show how, in a way, prescient Oakley was and how, even though he was restricted to living in Germany in Munich in the last few years of his life, he nevertheless was really in touch with what was happening, not just through the, the news media that he, was, he consumed every day, but also the conversations with artists which enabled him to escape from Munich. So um, in a way, it's almost as though reality has sadly caught up with the premise of his show in a kind of really dystopian fashion. Um, Can I just add, it's also a quick rejoinder to Mark's comment about this kind of escape from Munich too. I think there's, there's also something about the show that even though it's so particular to the States, it also feels like it's trying to make a new premise for thinking through these con conditions of perpetual grief, perpetual mourning, perpetual, um, perpetual trauma. And I think that these conditions can be, um, or these terms perhaps, should we land on something, can be applied to many other situations globally. And again, I think this is where the internationalist in, in Oakley is coming to the fore. There is something clearly peculiar and distinct about the American context, but um, there is nothing that distinct to think about the subconscious. And so this, this new thinking through the, the kind of perpetually traumatized subject, I believe um, can tie this to other things that have happened in, you know, Germany is one of those places where this kind of histories of deep trauma really resonate. Yes, I, 
let me see if I can summarize some other questions. There are some practical questions which maybe we can sort of take care of uh, rather quickly. One is uh, why was it important for artists to be on the advisory team in addition to curators and what have the curators learned from this approach? On, on one end, I should say that it was Aqua's choice to, to invite Glenn. Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, I, you know, typically I would say with an artist on the team, uh, as a curator, you have more um, latitude for uh, uh, how to call it, poetic licenses or, <laughs> or uh, uh, but I think in this case, Glenn, also you, you were very uh, mindful uh, to, in a sense, I think all of you were there to guarantee that we would scrupulously follow his uh, method, not more than coming in even and taking liberties, which maybe Glenn, you yourself would have taken in, in your show at the Pulitzer Foundation or, or in collision and encounters. I think it was more about guaranteeing, in a sense, a philological approach. But I don't know if you if you agree. Well, I think he, you know, a lot of the show, as you as you laid out before, uh, was thought through by Oakley, either artists that he picked specific pieces for, or just naming artists. And so I felt like my job was, uh, I had a couple of jobs. One is to sort of you know, be the interlocutor, have him bounce off ideas, you know, like I remember going to Munich a um, couple of weeks before he passed. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, Glenn, uh, Tyson Shori, you know, he should be in the show. And I just happened to be listening to this album Pillars. And I thought, that's a brilliant idea. And you're sitting in your hospital bed, making these, you know, <laughs> thinking through this show and expanding the parameters of the show. Um, so partially my job was to, you know, sort of bounce ideas off of, you know, back and forth with him, but also to sort of be true in some way to his vision for what the show would be, but also to expand, you know, out. There are artists that he probably maybe have mentioned in passing, but didn't, you know, give, hadn't been able to see their work in person. And so I think our job as a team was to think through how to add artists into the show, you know, under the, you know, sort of guidelines or ideas that he'd laid out for it. One question which is interesting is about the, the, um, very specific, if there were any consideration to the chromatic mood of the show, many of the works shown on the installation shots appear to be monochromatic, uh, and um, particularly the photos of Dao Bay, Adam Pendleton, Hank Willis Thomas, Naris Black Car. Um, I think certainly the, the second floor galleries um, have that recurring element of black and white photography, which was since the very first show of Aquia at the Guggenheim Museum uh, and until his latest essays for the Walter collection, it was a, a foundation of, uh, of his work through also Documenta and, and so on. I don't know if any of you want to say something about, but then I guess when you get to the second, to the third floor with Kerry James Marshall and Ellen Gallagher and Lorna Simpson, and even the Henry Taylor on the second floor, they're really explosions of colors because there has been a lot of black and white before. Um, oh, and we, um, in our discussions, we wanted, we discovered that, that different floors were having different chromatic values. And as you mentioned, one was particularly black and white. And so we tried to move things around a little bit, partly to, elite, to relieve that. But um, I don't think that, I don't think this really came up in, in our choice of, artists in a way the choice of artists and works was more in a way more urgent than that we, we didn't say oh let's have this Lorna Simpson rather than that because of the color I don't think that came into I don't recall that coming into it it didn't come in but there are these really beautiful resonances of blue as well which I love as you know you could kind of walk in under under Glenn's work thinking about the blues and then all of a sudden it gets sort of literalized also in the space of the uh, exhibition which is really beautiful too. Uh, to that extent, there is a question whether 
they were artworks that were left out or any dif difficulty deciding. I do want to say that the response from artists and lenders was uh, amazing. Uh, and that I think goes to, to, to really prove how great um, Okwi's relationship with many of his uh, friends and, and artists was, and, and really everybody came through. Um, I want to add a question, which is a question I didn't have a chance to ask Okwi, uh, maybe because I felt it was premature or maybe dumb even of me to ask. And, um, and in a sense relates also to, to his relationship with artists. The question is, which has also been asked of me in, in the preview days, which is, that the show is somewhat unique in his body of work because it's the only show that uh, focuses on black artists and, and African-American artists particularly. And I don't know if uh, any of you has any thought, you know, I, I took it also as a, for granted because I also understood it in the climate of America, um, but I don't know if any of you has a different point of view or perception. All of a sudden, we're all silent, um, <laughs> uh, which is rare. I should, people should know that that was rare in general in the planning of this exhibition. Um, I think this goes back to uh, the statement I made before that um, this is a show that is constitutive of work by Black artists uh, working inside the States, not all of them even sort of African-American or American-born. I think it's really a question, this is a show that is about a specific set of conditions, a specific set of living in um, a climate, um, a set, um, as you said earlier, uh, Glenn, a set of conditions that produces um, work that is about imagining the exterior of that, even understanding that you won't be, in, you can't access the exteriority. Um, and those are issues that um, supersede even the particularities of everyone on the checklist being a Black artist. I mean, this is a project that's trying to imagine how to, um, how to rethink social structures, social histories, and social trauma through the history of affect and emotion. Um, and how I believe those terms can translate to many places around the world. So I think the particularity of this historic um, circumstance in the US and the racial circumstance in the US is the genesis of the project. But the result of the project is something that I believe can translate glo globally. I should also say it was a question that none of the participating artists posed which I think, you know, maybe also proves is a stupid question of me to ask, but I thought it was interesting also how the artist felt it was a call that they needed to answer, you know, more so than other shows that I worked on where you have to, you know, perform some crazy curatorial acrobatics to, <laughs> to demonstrate that your concept is uh, acceptable. I, I was very um, both moved and, and, and somehow humbled by the fact that and uh, nobody even asked that question because it was um, maybe just needed to be done or felt that way. But I don't know, Glenn or Mark, if you have different perspectives. I was just going to say, mm. it didn't really come up in our discussions. I mean, we started with the list. Um, I'm not sure we ever really, I mean, we discussed the question of uh, na nationality. I mean, well, and as Naomi said so eloquently, that kind of political, cultural, conjunctural focus of the show being the United States at this particular time. Um, and I think the assumption was that the artists would be people of color, but we didn't actually discuss that. Um, and I'm not really sure how it would have come up in our conversation, um, actually. I mean, maybe Glenn or Naomi remember it differently, but I, it, it's just one of those things, as you said, Matt Massimiliano, just as the artists didn't say, oh, is this going to be a black show? Nobody raised that. And we didn't really have that discussion as a curatorial team. I mean, there was the logic and the premise was strong enough for us not to need to do that. Um, I think you're right, Mark. I think artists were responding to the urgency of the premise, 
but I think artists were responding to Oakley's passing too. Yes. Uh, and that a lot of the artists in the show had personal connections to him, or even if they didn't have personal connections to him, they understood that he was a tremendous curator. <laughs> and it was in a way an honor, I feel an honor to be in shows that he curated. And so there was this in willingness to make new work or make something available or recreate something. You know, people wanted to be in this show to honor his legacy. Yeah. There are many questions speaking of uh, honor in Oqui. Um, I'll try to summarize some that, that are uh, quite different, but one question is again about the um, spectacularization or commodification of grief. And uh, as a, let's say, satellite to que the question is also um, a question about how we think that Oki would have reckoned with the idea of cultural institutions and corporations rushing to change their tone and narrative with regards to Black Lives Matter and civil rights and violence against Black Americans. Um, and uh, in other words, to become an ally. Is there something potentially problematic in these objectifications? And um, so I don't know if you have thoughts about it or, um, or not. <laughs> yeah, big, big sigh. Um, <laughs> Well, I think the show had to be somewhere <laughs> as opposed to nowhere. So that's one thing. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to know how Oakley would have responded to that question, though I think he was quite aware of um, his positioning as a black curator, as an African curator in the art world in general. Um, I remember him telling me a story about his first days at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, and there was a press conference to welcome him. And one of the reporters asked him why he thought he was, he deserved to be the director of that museum. Like what, what did he think his qualifications were? And Oakley told me that he said, well, I didn't apply to be the director of this museum. I will, I was asked to be it. So you will have to ask them what they thought my qualifications were. But furthermore, I, I'm not a, an American, but I have many African-American friends and they would call that question throwing shade. You know. um, so so uh, I think, you know, Okwe was would be very aware of the sort of you know, rushed by institutions and corporations to embrace blackness and it's the problematic nature of it or the, the, the backhanded embrace that we've seen um, both in the art world and outside. So. Uh, many, many other questions. One question is about, uh, again, returning to, to the Venice Biennale, how you see Aquis Venice Biennale, how you see it laying the groundwater for grief and grievance. Um, I think we touched upon it partially speaking of sound, but I don't know if you want to add anything. Sorry, there are many questions, so I, I think it's hard to <laughs> summarize them all, but. I mean, just to answer, I mean, not to answer that, because I think, I don't think Venice particularly laid the ground for that. I think, as I said, Oakley was always in uh, very much in touch with, with current affairs and had been developing relationships with artists, particularly in relation to Venice, because a number of the artists that are in Grief and Grievance were in the Venice exhibition. But really, if anything, Grief and Grievance is a kind of crystallization of a certain kind of thinking. Um, I also just wanted to add separate from that, that the business of curating an exhibition like this, it is very intuitive and the exhibition grows and develops and to use that word again, crystallizes around the choice 
of the artists and we had a core group provided by Okri and then we added and each time you add the totality changes and then at the end you realize you've made an exhibition and you've realized that actually it is about grief and grievance as Okri had said at the beginning but it's a very circuitous route that you take to get there just because sometimes sometimes when people ask questions they assume that you set out with a frame within which you're working and then the works are there to illustrate the concepts and if anything it's the other way around that in a way one, one wants to use the exhibition to think about grief and mourning now in a way and that's that's what's slightly frustrating to me because I can't see the exhibition right now being stuck in California to see how how not just how it works in practice, but actually how it transforms our thinking about the issues which we tried to explain at the beginning. This will be maybe too journalistic of me, but uh, was there anything you would have asked Okwe about this show? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it just occurred to me that there were a few things. So, You know, I think I would have asked him about the layout. He was a very prescient um, uh, installer. And I, I think this is the thing that I miss the most in working on this project. And as amazing as it looks, and again, you know, hats off to you, Massimiliano and the team for really putting it together in such a tight way. And, and of course, we had all sorts of conversations about where things should go and who should be near whom, both aesthetically and even, um, you know, just sort of in the thinking about uh, inter-artist relationships. Um, I just always had the suspicion that Oki would have seen something else. Uh, and that maybe just maybe a new conversation could have come to the fore with his input. So that is where I really, I think I missed him the most in really thinking about the layout of the show. I think Massimiliano is probably quite, I wouldn't say lucky because we're very sad to lose Okri, but I think if Okri was doing the show, it would have changed. <laughs> More more times, Massimiliano might like to think <laughs> he would say, "Well, why not have so and so? Oh, let's have a whole body of work." And Massimiliano would say, "But there isn't room anymore." And say, "Yes, we can sort it out." I mean, it's very. I think that's the one thing I wanted to say about Ankri passing, and now we're all talking more about him as something in the past, as a presence in the past. But in a way, one wants to keep it focused on that energy which was a very disruptive energy it was very creative but he would always like Naomi says come in with something from left field which would transform the way everything connected together you didn't always agree with that but that was that was part of that energy and that experience I think um so anyway yeah I mean just to sort of pick up on that and the experience of working with him as an artist he was, I, I've said this in print, he was sometimes more ambitious for me as an artist than I was for myself. So that that neon that's on the facade of the building, you know, Oakley said, having seen some other neon said, Glenn, can a neon be outside? And I'm like, yeah, sure, it can be outside. But he didn't say where. <laughs> he just said outside. And then a couple of months later, I, I got a picture of the outside that he met. And it was the entire front facade of the Italian pavilion. And that's the biggest thing I've ever made in my career. And that was because of Oakley's ambition for me to be more ambitious, to expand my practice, you know? So he, that's why I think so many artists were so eager and anxious to be in this show because he did that for a lot of people. Even if he didn't know, that, know them personally, he still did that, you know? because he presented possibilities, you know, through the shows that other artists took and ran with, so. Well, Glenn, I think that's a, a great place where to end this conversation, both to, to remember Okwi, to uh, also, you know, recognize how many other doors and projects have been set in motion and open by him, so. Um, I want to thank you all so much for this conversation and for all your work 
and um, and really also to say the exhibition is really the product of of all the dialogues that we had with you and uh, and I hope when particularly Naomi and Mark can be in New York to see it we'll be able to celebrate in person uh, because it's uh, it's a great testament to to Aqui's work but I think you all made it um, as great as I can say it is because it's not my show. So <laughs> I can for once say it's a great show because it's really the product of Aqui and all your collaboration. So thank you so much. And thank you for all of you who have stayed through this presentation and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, good night. Bye.